and welcome to the Oddity Archive, the show just dumb enough to try and preserve willfully disposable culture. Now, way, way back on the original Format Wars episode, I devoted the last three or four minutes of that thing to the first major stab at an alternative to then-traditional video rental, and this was called Digital Video Express, or DivX. And uh, as I said in that episode, not to be confused with the video codec used these days that was cheekily named after it. But uh, anyway, ever since that episode, I've gotten just a ton of requests to do a whole episode on DivX, and I always shot it down because I felt like I just didn't have enough to make a full episode out of such a topic. Now, with that in mind, I've also gotten a lot of requests to tackle something called FlexPlay, which was the second major stab at this alternative to traditional video rental, which uh, involved self-destructing DVDs. But I could never find much of any information on it, and uh, worse yet, I could never find any of the discs. But recently, my luck has changed a little bit. I've found some information, and uh, probably more importantly, I found a couple of discs. So, between the two topics, uh, I think I've got enough to make an admittedly lopsided episode on. Let's get started. This year, wrap up the perfect family gift at Circuit City. Wrap up more sports, more movies, more music, more news. It's the Sony Digital Satellite System. With over 175 channels, the Sony Express Navigator can tune you into any program instantly. I fell into my role as the Minot family's resident AV geek slash new tech dilettante at a very young age. Between 1992 and 1998, I attempted to sell my folks on the Philips CDI, the 3DO, and Laserdiscs to no avail. In the fall of 1998, I scored my first techie victory when my father was looking at a new computer and I somehow convinced him that a normal old CD-ROM drive wasn't enough. We needed that fancy DVD-ROM drive. Largely because I really just wanted one of them newfangled DVD players, admittedly. But anyway, for the next three or four months, I scrimped and saved for any preferably cheap DVD movies I could get, then chained myself to that new computer, and proceeded to watch the same four movies over and over. In February of 1999, probably as my father's way of getting me the hell away from his computer, we went down to the nearby Circuit City to look at a real, honest-to-God DVD player. At the store, the salesman tried, with little necessary effort, to sell us on a DVD player equipped with this new thing called Digital Video Express, or DivX. In short, DivX, introduced starting in June of 1998, was a system that allowed you to watch special, heavily encrypted DVDs for 48 hours from the time you first popped it in the player, after being greenlighted by a server. Yep, you had to hook up a phone line. Anyway, most major new titles were released in this sub-format on the same day as their regular DVD and VHS counterparts, with the disc selling for $4.49 plus tax, plus another $3.25 if you wanted another 48 hours of view time. Anyway, to us, and up until that point devout blockbuster video going family, DivX seemed pretty awesome. Even though DVD had been on the market since 1996, our local blockbuster, or the grocery store for that matter, just wasn't warming to the format. In other words, they were charging $4 for an, if you're lucky, 24-hour new release rental on VHS, assuming they had it in stock, which sometimes didn't get watched anyway. The hassle of renting movies? If you have any additional questions, please call this number or visit our website, or a retail outlet near you.
Introducing DivX, the best way to watch movies at home. While we didn't stop going to Blockbuster completely, we did, for a few months at least, periodically head over to Circuit City for some DivX discs, especially when Blockbuster was out of whatever my folks wanted to see. But that summer, DivX was abruptly discontinued. We were notified via the startup screen on our DVD player that DivX was over, but that we'd be allowed to watch any unopened movies for the usual 48 hours for another two years. In the wake of this, Circuit City started slashing the price on their old stock to as low as 99 cents. In the very short term, I used the opportunity to watch a few more movies at a now much lower cost than renting, but within another month or so, I stopped. Over the span of those five-ish months, my family accrued a decent collection of discs, most of which landed in the trash well before the final grace period ended. On a related note, around the time that DivX went belly up, a Hollywood video opened across the street from our blockbuster, and they actually rented DVDs. So let's clear out a few stray bits of information before we take a better look at the discs, or at least one of them. Now, there was something called DivX Silver that was implemented that allowed you to have unlimited access, albeit just on your own machine, to your discs at 15 bucks a pop. Now, I have no recollection whatsoever of this whole DivX Silver thing, but I think had I heard of it, even back then, I probably would have called it a ripoff. Now, there was, on a related note, also something called DivX Gold that never did happen, in which you could have unlimited access to your disc on any DivX equipped player, which I'd be willing to bet pretty heavily was gonna be even more expensive than the whole DivX Silver thing. Uh, and also, another thing that I don't remember, but was apparently a thing, was that you could take any unwanted discs back to Circuit City or Good Guys or whatever you had in your neck of the woods and throw it in a dedicated recycling bin. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised in the slightest if my Circuit City just didn't bother with that. But uh, uh, my next point... As someone that did have DivX, and since there's no way I know of to watch the main portion of a DivX disc these days, let me just tell you what I remember. The picture and sound quality were precisely that of a regular DVD, because it is, it's just a more heavily encrypted DVD. But having said that, there were some little quirks, uh, very little ones, and uh, the most notable being that the video was only full frame. There are no widescreen DivXs that I know of, and uh, if the DivX training videos to go by, they're, they weren't going to be doing it, at least in the short term. And also, there never was DTS sound on any of these discs, because some of the DivX players didn't have DTS. So, yeah, there you go. And uh, as far as I know, there's nothing... Uh, carried over from the DVDs in terms of special features, not that I ever encountered, nothing on any of these discs. And um, also, to the best of my knowledge, save for the error screen that you saw at the top of today's show, there was nothing exclusive to DivX. So uh, I guess you could say it's not really much of a loss. And, uh, you know, let's uh, cap this off with just a quick look inside. There is nothing special. You got a chapter list, you got the disc, and you got the little thingy, little blurb underneath saying, if something's wrong with your disc, if you're having a problem or whatever, don't take it back to the store, give us a call. And realizing that I was going to encounter this and that you might be curious, I figured we'd give it a shot. So we're going to call 1-888-456-DIVX. 1-888-456-DIV. And I'll hold it up to the mic. The number you have dialed is invalid. Please check your listing and try your call again. The number you have dialed... Well, that's a bit of an anticlimax, isn't it?
In retrospect, DivX seemed like the ultimate short-sighted technology. I mean, Hollywood Video and a lot of the mom and pop stores were already carrying DVDs by the time DivX finished its national rollout in late 1998. Uh, and of course, Blockbuster followed suit shortly thereafter. But uh, anyway, segueing to our next topic, very shortly after DivX went belly up in the summer of 1999, Hollywood, in its infinite wisdom, decided that instead of letting this new DVD technology flourish, we ought to just double down on the whole disposable DVD concept. And so, in the process, they came up with something that was somehow even more short-sighted than DivX. That's quite an accomplishment. And, of course, we've touched on this very briefly already. This was called FlexPlay or EZD for the own titles. They're the same thing. We love the drama, the laughter, the passion, the adventure, and most importantly, we love the escape. But let's face it, we don't love the hassles. You know what I mean. How many times have you paid for a DVD rental and then returned it without even watching? While the corpse of Divix was still warm, Hollywood decided to continue their quest to maximize all potential profits in the home video market. In 1999, the newly formed FlexPlay Technologies was brought in to hopefully succeed where Divix had failed. FlexPlay discs were designed to play in any standard DVD player, but would rot itself out of existence within 48 hours of the original package being opened. The idea was to take the existing layers of a DVD, introduce a corrosive, when exposed to oxygen, chemical agent into the usual layer adhesive, and deliberately not do such a hot job of sealing the DVD layers together, thereby allowing the chemicals to do their damage with maximum efficiency. Along the way, another technology, known as SpectraDisc, was acquired, which, thanks to some dyes, caused the center ring area of fresh discs to be a red color, only to turn black when the disc had rotted beyond use. In mid-2003, test marketing of these new discs began, and at $7 a pop, plus some impracticality and e-waste concerns, well, that and the titles were a minimum of six months old already, consumer interest was just a bit limited. In spite of this, FlexPlay was rolled out in some parts of the U.S. throughout the rest of the year. In 2004, FlexPlay was sold off to the Convex Group, at the time a primarily entertainment industry-oriented patent holding company, and the rollout of FlexPlay, plus a price cut to five bucks a disc, continued. In 2008, for reasons unknown, Staples office supply stores took on the bulk of FlexPlay's inventory, to a continued lack of interest. By the end of the year, Staples marked down their remaining FlexPlay stock, at least the stuff that hadn't rotted on the shelf, to 99 cents, and FlexPlay went bye bye at the end of the year. More recently, a revision of the old FlexPlay technology was branded as DVD-D, or DVD Disposable. These discs use the same chemical agent, but it's now sealed within a different area of the disc, and is only released once the disc first spins in the player. As of this episode, DVD-D is apparently floundering along with minimal distribution, mostly in France and Germany. Now, here's where the whole FlexPlay concept gets especially short-sighted. As I mentioned, these discs would rot away within about 48 hours of you opening the airtight packaging. But the chemical agent used on these was already hard at work, so much so that the discs would rot away within about a year from the time of manufacturing. And indeed, both of my discs carry an expiration date of 2005. And uh, if you look in the back here, uh, it might not show up, but it's just as well there'll be a segment in just a second here. Uh, you can see the discs poking through, and they've turned black, the little rings around the center. And it's the same for both of them. But uh, anyway, in spite of this, this being the archive and all, 
I guess I ought to crack one of these suckers open and see if we can get anything from these discs. All right, well, I've managed to make the number one all-time boo-boo of my time making this show, and I did a full unpackaging of the Armageddon DVD, and I accidentally deleted it. So I just wanted to show you this. It is open. Uh, it's out of the package. I cut open the package. It's turned a bit yellow, I noticed, and everything's turned black, but the disc itself uh, is still kind of a red, so... Uh, uh, in spite of my amazing screw-up, let's try this anyway. And, uh, no, I don't intend to open this one. Uh, I'd like to keep one sealed just as a collector's piece. But, uh, yeah. Game on! Armageddon, and as you can see, the... It's turned black. Good until, what is that, July of 2005. Um, I think we missed that boat. All right. Here we go. Okay. It feels a little thicker than a normal DVD. Um, yeah. Okay, seeing as I have no great way of going out of my Blu-ray player and taking a direct feed into anything, we're just gonna have to settle for the good old camcorder. So, I got my Armageddon disc. Let's give it a shot. Oh, 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 oh. Oh my god. It's a red letter day in archive land. Look at that. I guess I ought to maybe try and take a quick transfer of this thing. Okay, so I have an external Blu-ray drive for my computer, so let's start with that. And I know you can't see it, so you'll just have to listen. There's the disc, and here we go in. Now, I tested this already with another disc just to make sure it worked. Uh, so the drive is in working order. And it's just starting up and then kind of crapping out, so... Uh, I don't think this is going to happen. Let's try the built-in drive on this computer. Okay, let's do a test just sticking this in the computer and see what happens. Well, that sounded nice. No? Yes? Maybe? Kinda, sorta? Nope, it just seems to be choking on it. Oh! Hey! See if we can make any headway with this. Although I'm feeling less and less optimistic. 
this might be some very quick acting chemical agent they were using. Okay, it sounds like my player is trying to crap out. The files don't seem to exist. Unfortunately. All right. Let's try a standard DVD player directly in, see if we can't salvage this guy. All right, let's give our first little update here. I first tested this disc at a little after 2 o'clock this afternoon, and it is now, what, 9.15 or so? Yeah, 9.16. And I've been noticing as I play with this that it's already starting to rot, and it's rotting from the end of the movie back in. So right now it's giving out around the 1 hour and 20 minute mark, so... Let's see if I can't fast forward to that point and see where it dies at the moment, and then we'll take another update tomorrow. Any day now. Alright, it dies sometime around the scene transition, around the chapter transition, so I might have to take a cut. Uh, let's see here. And there it goes. So right now it is dying at one hour and, uh, well it's jumping ahead, it was one hour and twenty minutes and I believe fifty-six seconds, so we'll take another look at this thing tomorrow and we'll just watch this die. Alright, update number two. Uh, it is now 12.49 p.m., so it's uh, a little shy of 24 hours since I opened this thing, and I've already dinked around with this a bit, and it's still crapping out at the same spot as last night, which is 1 hour, 20 minutes, and 26 seconds. Uh, I screwed that up last night. I said 56. It's really 26. But, uh, yeah, let's take a look at the last five seconds or so of this thing before it dies. And there you go. Stay tuned for further developments, or non-developments. Well, I guess I technically missed day three. Uh, we're well past the 48-hour mark. Um, I was gone all day, so, yeah. I guess technically this is day four now. But, um, I don't know what to say. No news is good news? Honestly, I'm getting kind of sick of this movie. Alright, here we are at the end of day number four, and it is now 9.41 p.m., and I'm, uh, I, I've 
dubbed this thing my little zombie disc because at least in this player it's just in this purgatory it's not really alive it's not really dead it's just half half of everything so uh yeah we'll take another quick look here but i i'll do one more check of this thing but i'm kind of ready to just as i said call it my little zombie disc and then it just starts skipping ahead mindlessly brainlessly even by technology standards okay here we are just a little past the 96 hour mark from the time I opened this and I'm calling this my last update and you're gonna be so shocked at how this turned out same story different day so um, I there this has got to be a metaphor for something and I guess it's somehow weirdly appropriate in some way I haven't quite figured out yet that I am now stuck with this zombie disc that only half works on one machine um, if that's not an archivism I don't know what is so we'll just let you see this one more time and uh, I guess it's appropriate that it would be this movie because this movie makes me feel like a zombie. Um, yeah, I've never liked this stupid movie. Anyway, um, that's it for today's archive and yesterday's archive and the day before that 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 and the day before that, 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 and the day before that. What if DivX goes out of business? That's a fair question. But here's the bottom line. It's almost impossible to believe that DivX could go under. DivX is supported by major movie studios like Disney, Universal, Fox, DreamWorks, Paramount, MGM, and manufacturers like RCA, ProScan, Pioneer, Panasonic, JVC, and Harman Kardon. However, should there be a problem, you would still have a fully functioning DVD player that will still play your existing DivX movies. Most importantly, when you see how DivX works, I think you'll agree it's, it's going to be a big hit.